Well, Shannon mentioned it yesterday when she was so kindly introing me, but I received my Bachelor of Arts from Cal Baptist University. Woo woo, Lance up, any fellow Lancers? Okay, yeah, you're by, yeah, by default, yes, Susan, anyone else? Yes, Jessica, I knew that. Um, so that's where I got my degree from, but where you may not know, just honestly, always been a point of great embarrassment to me is that was actually the third time I went to college. And it took 10 years changing my major three different times before I actually officially graduated. You see, when I was fresh out of high school, I thought that I wanted to be a professor. And so I wanted to teach at the college level, and so I went into English Lit. Yes, woo woo, all my English nerds in the house. Um, reading, what's up? You guys know I love to read. So I was like, oh, this is perfect. I'll take what I'm passionate about reading and nerding out and perfect, English lit. So that's what I first went and got my degree in. And then I got married and then we had babies and I was like a year away from graduating but ended up stopping school in order to focus on being a wife and mom. Well, then a few years later, as God orchestrated all the details of my life, I ended up going back to work when my girls were young, and I went to work in an orthopedic surgeon's office. And before long, they kind of thought that they saw something in me and identified something in me, so the surgeons that I worked with kind of took me under their wing and started teaching me and training me and letting me sit in on the OR, and I became passionate about medicine, fell in love with it. And as I was falling in love with it, they were encouraging me, you should really go back to school and get your degree and become a physician's assistant. So I talked to my husband and we were like, okay, that sounds awesome. And the paychecks look real nice. So let's start pursuing that. So then this was like four years later, I went back to school again completely did a 180 and uh, declared as a biology major in preparation to go to PA school for my master's. Got through about a year and a half of biology credits and human anatomy and lots of medicine stuff. And then God stopped that process because it was at that time that he called me into full-time ministry. And it was right when I was going down this trajectory of, yes, medicine, I love it, I'm passionate about it, I loved orthopedics because we weren't dealing with life and death situations, we were just dealing with improving people's quality of life, and I loved it. But then God said, I have different plans for you. And he called me into full-time ministry, and I accepted the role of uh, early childhood overseer at uh, Compass Aliso Viejo. Pumped the great brakes on school, started full-time ministry, and it was a couple years into full-time ministry until my husband and I sat down again and had the conversation of, wow, I think that this is what God is calling me to do for the rest of my life. I think that he is wanting me to be in vocational, vocational ministry forever. And so I talked with my husband about that. I talked about... Uh, that with my boss at the time, lots of different conversations with like pastors and friends and asking, does this seem wise? Are, are you guys seeing the same thing? And the resounding answer was yes. And so then if the resounding answer was yes, then it was, okay, I should go back to school then and <laughs> for the third time um, to get a degree in this. And it was at that time that I registered at CBU, declared my major to be uh, Christian Ministries, and the rest is history, except for this one thing. I had to gather this hodgepodge of transcripts and take them into my academic advisor, my guidance counselor, because before I started the program, she was gonna sit down with me and map out every single class I needed to take for every single semester in order for me to graduate. And I was dreading this appointment. 
I was dreading this appointment. It was like 10 years later than when I had originally should have graduated after I graduated from high school. And it was embarrassing to me. English lit to bio to Christian ministries, like, girl, do you know what you want to do? It was just so embarrassing. And so here I go waltzing into her office, like kind of ashamed and embarrassed of this like ridiculous display that I had to show her. And I vividly remember sitting, sitting in her office in this little corner chair while she typed in all of my stuff to see what exactly could they accept from what I had previously done? What were some of the classes that I needed to either take all over or that wouldn't transfer or whatever? And then how much longer would it take for me to finally have a diploma? And so I sat there just feeling super nervous and super embarrassed. And then she said this, wow, I've never seen that before. <laughs> and I was like, great. Yes, I understand. Like, no one else is as flighty as I am and, like, can't get stuff together. Great. But she pushed back from her desk and she turned around and she looked at me and she said, I've literally never seen this before. We are able to accept every single one of your previous classes. And not only are all of your general ed requirements met, but you actually have some classes here that meet your upper class uh, requirements. You've actually taken classes previously that will meet these upper level requirements. So then she starts like furiously typing away at the computer and plugging stuff in and, and I'm sitting there like, wait, what, what, how is this possible? English lit and bio and, and it's equaling this Christian ministries degree? What are you talking about? And so she starts furiously typing away in her computer and she goes, oh my gosh. She goes, because of everything that you've done in the past, it is only gonna take you 18 months to finish this degree. The shortest amount of time possible to spend at that school in this major in order to get this degree, th that's it. That's what you have here. And chills and tears and what? God had sovereignly in his good plan taken what I thought was this hodgepodge, embarrassing trajectory that I had been on and he had perfectly lined everything up in order for me to be ready for what he ultimately was calling me to do for the rest of my life. I did actually get that diploma, by the way. <laughs> it's sitting in my office. You can fact check me if you want. But I did graduate 18 months later with that degree, with that diploma finally in hand in Christian ministries. God's beautiful plan was made so evident to me in that moment. And it was one of the starkest ways that I've ever seen him weaving this beautiful tapestry of my life together for his good purpose. Well, today, you guys, as we open up our Bibles and look at Ruth 2, we're going to have the opportunity to see God's loving plan in the lives of Ruth, Naomi, Boaz, and ultimately even us in the way that he brought this family together and in the way that he orchestrated all of the things in their lives. So if you would please open your Bibles with me and turn to the book of Ruth. We're gonna be spending our time this morning in chapter two. I'm just gonna start off by reading the first two verses, so follow along with me. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she, being Naomi, said to her, go, my daughter. Okay, let's just stop right there. Gleaning. She asks to go glean. What is that all about? Well, God, in his good, loving, sovereign plan, had made this a part of, again, the Mosaic law that foreigners people who had fallen on bad times, poor people could go and do this thing called gleaning at harvest time. So you don't need to turn there, but I'm going to read this and you can uh, jot down the reference. Leviticus 19, 9 through 10. And this is what God is, is commanding Moses to reiterate to the Israelites. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. 
neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Okay, so what God was saying here is that at harvest time, they were not to, the owners of the, of the land or of the field were not to go all the way up and take absolutely everything. They were intentionally supposed to leave a border around their field in order for the poor or the sojourner to come in and help themselves to it. They were supposed to be willing to share in this way. So God had made this loving plan that was going to provide for Ruth and Naomi at this time, like two to three centuries previously, by giving this law to Moses. We're going to continue to see the way that God's sovereign loving plan comes together in such a miraculous way in this text. So I want you to put point number one down on your outline like this. Be encouraged by God's loving plan. Point number one on your outline is be encouraged by God's loving plan. We're going to continue on to read verses three through seven. So she, now we're talking about Ruth. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Did you guys catch that? The author is writing these things in such a way as to alert our attention. It's almost written in this highly, like, ironic, almost, like, sarcastic kind of tone of, then this happened, Oh my goodness, and wouldn't you know it, then this happened. It, he, it's written in a way as to alert the reader's attention to say, no, this can't just be happening. There has to be a loving, sovereign hand at work here, orchestrating all of these things in order to make all of this fall into line. So let me point these things out to you. You can like underline them or box them off or circle them to see all these different ways that God is doing it in this passage. It actually starts in chapter one, that very last verse in chapter one, verse 22. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, um, and Ruth the Moabite daughter, so Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, wow, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Okay, again, because we're not reading this in the original language. Sometimes we miss the connotation of some of these words. This word came right here has this connotation, has this sort of meaning of, oh, and they happened to come. Or, oh, by chance they came at this time. Or, by a stroke of good luck, This is the time that they arrived. So the first instance that we see of this chance going on is in Ruth 1.22. Next, look down at verse 3 in chapter 2. So she set out and went and gleaned in her field, in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. Oh, she just happened to show up to just the right field? Next, number four, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. This, again, this word here, the way that it's written, and behold, it's kind of like saying, and wouldn't you know it, Boaz shows up at just the right time. So look at this, ladies. We've got that they happened to arrive at just the right time of year. We've got that she happened to show up to just the right place. And then not only is she in the right place at the right time, but then the person who's going to radically change her life happens to come to check on his field at the exact same time that she's there. 
There is a sovereign hand at work here in Ruth and Naomi's lives and in the timing and the orchestration of all of these events. There's one more here, and it's actually a little more subtle. But if you look down at verse 5, Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she's the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Okay, so it's not even the fact that Boaz showed up It's that Boaz showed up at just the right time where his young man, his foreman, the guy that was working for him, was able to give a detailed account of who this woman was. It's not that Ruth and Boaz showed up at the same time. Boaz showed up a little bit later so that the foreman is able to say, oh, this is who that woman is, and he's able to speak to her character. Not just inform him, oh, this is who she is, she's that chick that came back from Moab, but to say, this is her work ethic. She has worked hard. She came and she approached me and asked if she could work in this field. And then with the exception of a short rest, this woman's been working hard. Boaz showed up not just at the right time to be able to see Ruth, but in order to hear a secondhand account of who she was and her character. It's pretty amazing to see only God can orchestrate these sorts of things in our lives. Only God can orchestrate any of the paths and the days and the minutes and the hours of our lives. I have to tell you guys this really cool story, actually, about this stage set, this like cool hexagon thing that is propped up behind me, (laughs) standing behind me. Okay, so... You guys got to see Jen. She was up here playing the game. Jen had gathered a team to help her with our stage decor, which can we just take a minute and say, like, thank you, ladies. It looks awesome. It's so beautiful. I heard so many of you going, wow, it looks so great in here last night when you arrived. So thank you, ladies. Okay, so... Jen had got this idea in her head, kind of this picture of what she wanted to do with the stage. And so she happened to be following an Instagram account that posted this hexagon frame. And so she took a screenshot of it and she sent it to the gals that she had gathered. And she said, hey, this is kind of the vision that I'm going for. I'm gonna ask Mike, I think this would be something that would be pretty easy for us to build. So just so you guys know, like, this is kind of where we're going with it. Okay, so she sends that text message off. Then she goes back to Mike and she's like, hey, what do you think about this? Like, can we build this? And he's like, like any good husband, um, no. <laughs> he's like, uh, it's going to take too much time. It's going to take, cost way too much, like way more of, than what you have in your budget to work with. There's, there's no way. So Jen was like, man, what a bummer. Like, I really had this thought in my head of, of kind of what this would look like. Okay, so she goes back to the drawing board and starts kind of brainstorming. What else could we do? Like, do we have anything else that we could make like this? She starts brainstorming. Never texts the rest of her squad back to tell them that there's been a change of plans. Meanwhile, one of the girls in that text thread just happened to follow the exact same Instagram of the account that Jen took a screenshot of and sent this picture to. And in the coming days, wouldn't you know it, but those people posted, hey, we're doing a giveaway of what? This very piece. (laughs) So our very own Alyssa White entered, I don't know what hoops she had to jump through. They make you jump through like a thousand hoops to participate in those dumb Instagram (laughs) giveaways, right? Like, comment, follow 85 people, and then tag 200, and you'll be entered for a chance to win. I don't know what she had to do, but she somehow she got her name in. Ladies, there were 3,000 entries. 3,000 people entered to win A hexagon made of wood. I don't know. (laughs) Guess whose name got drawn? Alyssa's name got drawn, you guys. And we won. We were given 
this piece of hexagon. Isn't that amazing? If that isn't enough to give you chills, guess what passage of scripture I happened to be studying that day when I got this text relaying all of this information to me that we had been gifted, given one out of one of 3,000, this piece. I was right here in Ruth 2. I had been thinking and seeing and amazed at the hand of our sovereign God. And on that very day is the day that I got that text. And I texted her back right away and I said, this is gonna be an illustration. (laughs) But it was so amazing. We have a God who is not only sovereignly working out the really big details of our lives, but he's so intricately and intimately involved in even these tiny little things of even of us being able to look, at, at the, look up at this stage and see something beautiful and see something that's pretty and see something that's aesthetically pleasing that helps us to draw into his excellencies. It's amazing, the hand of God. Jot this verse down, Isaiah 36, eight through 10. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. That's our God. His will will be accomplished in our lives. And whatever needs to be done in order for this just so happened and you just happened to be there and wouldn't you know it, then this fell in line. Ladies, when we stand on the other side of eternity, we're going to get the full picture of just how incredibly involved in every single aspect of our lives God was. I love this because we get to see this in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So write this down. Psalm 25:10. Psalm 25:10, one of my favorite verses. All the paths of the Lord are hesed and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his testimonies. This is another one we all know and love, but it's Romans 8, 28. And we know for those who love God, all things work together for good and for those who are called according to his purpose. Both in the New Testament, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we get these quantitative word, all things, all paths. You guys, all means all. That means whatever horrifying, painful path of suffering that you may be needing to walk down right now. That means whatever warm and fuzzy and sweet season you may be in right now. All means all. Every single aspect of our lives is sovereignly planned out and ordained and nothing is left to chance. Nothing going on in your life right now does he not see and is he not intimately and intricately involved with. You guys know we can't have a retreat without me talking about Elizabeth Elliot, right? (laughs) I mean, there's no way. But she says this, she has this quote that I think so eloquently describes God's involvement. This is what she says. "I I only have two choices. God is either God or he is not. I am either held in the everlasting arms or I'm at the mercy of chance. I have to trust him or deny him. Is there any middle ground? I don't think so. There's no middle ground because all means all. Some of you in this room are experiencing very real trials, very real pain right now. Grief grave health concerns for you or for someone you love, betrayal, loss, hurt, heartache. 
My prayer is that no matter what season we're in, whether it's a season of bountiful harvest or whether it's a season of walking through the valley of the shadow of death, that we would use this account in Ruth and we would call to mind all of the ways that we have seen God work out, not only in our lives, but in the lives of people around us, his good and loving plan. What we're reading right now in the book of Ruth is the redemption of Naomi and Ruth. But let us not forget what previously happened. Naomi had to leave her home for, because of a famine. So in order for them to leave their home because of a famine, what kind of living situations were they living in before they made the decision to leave? Hunger? I don't know what else. Then she gets to this new place and she loses her husband and her sons. Ruth lost her husband and then left the only place that she had ever known to go and follow after God and Naomi. They went through real loss and real suffering and real trial and we get to see right now the crowning moments of how God redeemed their story but don't forget how their story start out, started out as, with a lot of loss and a lot of hurt and a lot of heartache. The God of Ruth is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he is just as concerned with your life and my life as he was with Ruth and Naomi's. And just as he had given this plan 200 to 300 years in advance of them going through this, what sorts of things has God planned out centuries previously that are affecting our lives right now, that are for his good purpose? What are things that we're going through right now that we can see his plan? We need to be encouraged by that. The word encouragement means to get support, to get help, to get buoyed up, to get bolstered. It literally means to gain courage. And so when we say be encouraged by God's good plan, we need to be, gain our courage by God's loving hand, by seeing it in the pages of scripture, by recounting it in our own minds and to one another. Next, we get to see another example of how we can live out this hesed. We saw it last night in Naomi by her sacrificial love. Then we saw it twice in Ruth by her faithful and her humble love. And now enters a third character onto the scene. And we get to see how Boaz exemplifies this Hesed love. So please put point number two on your outline like this. If we're gonna be women that are committed to a legacy of love, we must be women that are committed to love extravagantly. Love extravagantly. And we're gonna see that in verses eight through 18 of chapter two. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and she said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. 
and also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening, then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw that what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. The love that we see Boaz pour out on Ruth, who at this point is a stranger and a foreigner to, to him, is none other than extravagant kind of love. 14 commands does he give concerning Ruth and her well-being in these few verses that I just read. So again, if you want to box them off or underline them, I'm going to read them off to you. 14 times does he go above and beyond in his care and concern and showing love to Ruth. Verse number eight, do not glean in another field. Do not leave this one. Keep close to my young women. Those are the first three. Do not glean in another field. Do not leave this one. Keep close to my young women. It would be one thing for him to be a Pharisee of sorts and just fulfill the Mosaic law to say, okay, sure, you can come and essentially mooch off of me for today, but then can you move along? Can you go find, there's a lot of other fields here in Bethlehem. You know, we've had a lot of rain. God visited his people and brought us food. So there's lots of other people that can share with you. So for today, you're good. I've checked my box on the law. But then after that, like, you're gonna kind of annoy me. You're gonna kind of annoy my workers. No, that's not what he says. He says, stay here, don't go anywhere else. Let me be the one that is being generous to you. Verse number nine, let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping. Again, keep your your gaze here, don't go anywhere else. Number two in verse nine, go after them being his young women. Number three, or in verse nine, have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink. All of those commands are in verse nine. Again, this is amazing because he again, for a third time, commands her not to leave his field. But then he says this, have I not charged the young men not to touch you? That was a really big deal because Ruth is currently, was a foreigner in the land of Israel. And to be a foreigner anywhere, was bottom of the societal totem pole. And to be a poor foreigner, you're way down there. You are totally susceptible to physical, sexual abuse. And so Boaz goes out and protects Ruth by telling his young men, do not touch her. He loves her extravagantly by protecting her. Next, he says, when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink. Again, huge, not societal norm. Because foreigners were at that very bottom place in the totem pole, they were treated as slaves. They were treated as, you're not a a native-born Israelite, so guess what? You're going to be the one to serve the rest of us. To be a foreigner at this time, the typical custom was that you would be the one to go and draw the water, to bring it to the native Israelites, and then they would drink of it, and you were not to drink of the same vessels that they were drinking of. But Boaz says the opposite. Not only does he not even charge her to go get the water, but he says, come, drink from the same things that we're drinking from. This is an extravagant love that he is showing now in his welcoming of him folding her in to his home, to his family, amongst his workers. Next, verse 14, come here, eat some bread, dip your morsel. Three more commands concerning her. Again, it would be one thing to say, oh, hey, it's lunchtime. You want to come sit in the shade over there? Oh, okay, you're good. We're going we're gonna to be over here. He invites her in. Come with us. Let me share not only what's in my field, but now let me share what's on my table with you. Come here. Eat some bread. Dip your morsel. 
above and beyond kind of love. Verse 15, so all of those first 11, is it 11? 10, thank you. Um, All of those first 10 commands he gives directly to Ruth about the way that he is showing her extravagant love. But now you guys look at this. And this next set of commands, now he turns to the people around him and he gives them commands of how to love her in this extravagant sort of way. In verse 15, he's speaking now to his young men and this is what he says to them. Let her glean even among the sheaves. Again, way above and beyond the Mosaic law. Not only was she allowed to glean among the that border that they wouldn't go all the way up into, but he says, let her come all the way in. Let her glean among all of you. And then the next thing he says is, do not reproach her. Don't give her a hard time for that. Don't make fun of her for being in the position that she's in. So not only has he protected her physically, but now he protects her verbally from verbal abuse that may have come. Verse 16, it just keeps going and going and going, this extravagant display of love. Pull out some bundles for her and leave it for her to glean. Not only let her glean among you, but now intentionally pull some out and leave some behind. And then another command in verse 16, and do not rebuke her. 14 ways that he goes up above and beyond in showing Ruth love. The definition of extravagantly is exceeding what is reasonably appropriate, absurd. There is a level of like absurdness to what is going on here. Like you are being so overly kind and so overly generous. If this were going on in today's society, I guarantee you there would be people around him saying, why are you letting her take advantage of you? Why are you letting her be a mooch? And yet Boaz is there just lavishing this extravagant, this above and beyond. He's thought through every single aspect of her needs and he goes above and beyond to meet them. Do you wanna know what's crazy about this whole thing? Is the reasoning Boaz gives for him showing her this extravagant love in the first place. Look at chapter two, verse 11. In just the first set of commands that he gives her about how he wants to show her this extravagant love, which is essentially just don't go anywhere else. Stay here, you're welcome here, you're welcome among my people. Just in those first four, I think, commands, she's already blown away by him. And she's already like, what have I done that I should find favor, that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Listen to what he says, Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and mother and your native land and you came to a people that you did not know before. This is incredible. What Boaz is saying here is that he has been inspired by her example of Hesed. He saw what she was doing and he was like, I wanna love like that. I wanna be a part of that. And don't we see that? Can't we see that in and amongst us as well? When we experience an extravagant kind of love, when we see others being a part of something that is incredible, we wanna jump on it. Love breeds love. My husband and I, for our 13 year wedding anniversary just recently, we went to New England. And when we came home, I happened to notice that this pot that had been sitting outside my front door was suddenly filled with beautiful succulents. And I was like, there's no way that grew in like the course of a week. What happened here? And it was just, it was beautiful. The thing about this pot is that I had originally had some plants in there, but because of my black thumbs, it had died and it had been this shriveled up, really sad looking pot of dirt for like months. 
And it was one of those things where every time I walked past it, I was totally embarrassed by it, but also one of the things that as soon as I wasn't looking at it anymore, it was out of my head and I wasn't thinking about it. So we came home and the very first thing that I notice is this beautiful pot of succulents like overflowing. And I was like, what, what, what happened? Who did this? So thanks to Blink, our video security system. <laughs> I was like, Mike, what, can you go back on the blank and see who did this? Like, there's no note, like, like no one texted me to say like, I'm gonna come do this while you're gone. What happened here? And so sure enough, we're, there we are. And sure enough, we found it. A few days before that, one of the women in this room knew that we were on vacation had been to my house multiple times and saw my sad, pathetic pot <laughs> of dead soil. And she came while we were on vacation, humbly, without having told me she was going to do this, without leaving a note or anything, and she filled my pot literally to overflowing. And when I saw this, it like took my breath away. The intentionality, the care, the love was extravagant to me. So of course I texted her. I'm like weeping over this pot of succulents. <laughs> but you know what that did for me? That inspired me. That made me for the next two weeks think and pray, how can I do this for someone else? What can I do to be so thoughtful and so intentional and just blow someone out of the water by the love that, and care that I'm going to show to them. And praise God in his kindness, he gave me a few ways to be able to do that and I was able to execute that. But I've experienced this. I've experienced this love breeding love that when you see it in action and when you've been the recipient of it, it just makes you wanna go out and be a part of that and do that in the life of someone else. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharp, like iron sharpening iron and one man sharpens another. We can be that to one another by being these examples of extravagant love and by letting love breed love. I love this verse in Romans 12, 10, maybe because it feeds in a little bit to my competitive nature, but it says, love one another with brotherly affection outdo one another in showing honor. That's Romans 12, 10. We should be like clamoring to show one another love and honor in order to live out this legacy of love. It takes time. It takes it. When we went back and we looked at this blank, you guys, I, it, it, it's still like to this day, I'm fighting back tears thinking about it. Like she spent hours, like she came, she looked at it, she left. I think she must've gone and picked up succulents. Then she came back and she was potting all of them. And I'm watching all of this on the screen, like blown away that someone would show me this kind of care and this kind of love. And I'm really thankful for my blink because <laughs> it inspired me. It inspired me to go and do the same thing for those around me, outdo one another in showing honor. Not because we're trying to get credit, not because we're trying to make a name for ourselves, but because when we've been the recipient of this kind of extravagant love, it breeds love. One more thing I'd like to point out before we move on from point number two. I promise point number two will end at some point. <laughs> Ruth still stays humble even in the midst of her being now praised for showing extravagant love, she still is staying humble like we talked about yesterday. In verse 13, after Boaz explains to her why it is that he's showing her this kind of extravagant love, she says, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. This word that she uses of herself for servant was like the very least of the servants. It would be like the chamber pot maid of servants. It would be like the servant who had no seniority, no rights, like very bottom of the totem pole. Even in the midst of this wealthy man taking notice of her and showing her this kind of extravagant love because of what she's done, 
she still has a humble mindset, and she still says, I'm just a servant. It's amazing to see her continued hum humility in this whole process. Let's move on to read the rest of the chapter to find out how this all ends, God's loving plan. In just these one 24 hours of her life, verse 19, so she brings home, oh, sorry, you know what? One other thing I do want to point out. See, point number two never ends. Uh, an ephah of barley in uh, verse 17. An ephah, uh, commentators are really split because depending on the time, exactly when this would have happened in Israelite history, they were using different measurements. But most commentators agree that an ephah of barley was probably anywhere from like 20 to like 80 pounds. Most commentators think it was on the lower end because how on earth would this woman have been able to carry home like 80 pounds of barley? Um, so they think it was probably more like 20 pounds, but like 20 pounds of barley for one day's work? This is incredible. And so she comes home, she shows her mother-in-law what she's brought, she even brings her food because she had some left over from Boaz's extravagant love and generosity. And so in verse 19, her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I worked today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter, may he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, besides, he said to me, you shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to her, Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in any other field you should be assaulted, like we talked about. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Point number three on your outline is praise God for his loving plan. As we live out this legacy of love, let us be women who praise God for his loving plan. As Naomi comes home and recounts the details of her day, Naomi recognizes instantly who is to credit for this, and it's God. Remember we saw like a great moment of Naomi and then like an icky moment of Naomi. Here's another great moment of Naomi. She instantly credits God as being the one who has orchestrated and planned all this out and have given them such great success in just these 24 hours. In verse 20, Naomi says, may he be blessed by the Lord. There she's talking about Boaz. But then she says, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Whose kindness is she talking about there? She's talking about the Lord's kindness. The Lord's kindness. And guess which word is there in Hebrew for kindness? Hesed. Whose steadfast love has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi instantly recognizes God is at work here and he is the one to be acknowledged and thanked and praised. We see one more aspect here of the just so happened. And it just so happened that this man Boaz wasn't just a noble man, wasn't just a wealthy man, wasn't just an extravagantly loving man, but he was a redeemer. And we're gonna talk more about what that means and what the implications of that were in our last session. But that's really important. It's not just that he's any kind and good man. He's a redeemer. Naomi sees what's going on and she rightly responds in praise of God and of attributing all of the success to his good kindness. Ladies, let us be women that are so involved in the lives of others, whether it's the lives of one another, or our husband, or our children, or even to non-believers, that we can say to them, 
Praise God for the way that he's working that out in your life. Do you not see his good hand here? Do you not see his steadfast love towards you? Be someone who's not only recognizing the steadfast love of God in your own life, but someone who is quick to point it out in the lives of others. Like I said, we can do that not just with each other, but let's do that with our husbands. Let's go home and be encouragers of our husbands when we see the way that God is working in their lives, when we see his steadfast love and kindness in the life of our family, in the life of our kids, even in the life of unbelievers. Is God's common grace not over even the unbelievers? Is he not beckoning? Is it not his will that all would come to repentance? We can call it out even in their lives. Wherever we go, may we be billboards for God, alerting those around us to his involvement, to his loving plan. This was a really cool episode because it all happened in the course of 24 hours. And this was all really good stuff that was going on. But like I said, what we're seeing in Ruth right now is the redemption we're seeing the upswing of what had previously been a really dark valley that they had to walk through. I love, love, love this account from Corey Ten Boom in her book, The Hiding Place, because she explains this incredible way that her sister responded to something, attributing God's goodness and God's kindness to something when she didn't want to and when it seemed really icky. And the story goes like this. Corey and her sister had been um, taken because they were found to be hiding Jews. They were hiding them from the Nazis. And one day the Gestapo came in and they ripped them from their homes and they took them to concentration camps. And at this point in the story, they have just been transferred to another concentration camp, Ravensbrück, which was a horrible death camp a horrible work camp. To even read the account of what they went through is deplorable and very disturbing. But what happened on the first night that they got there is that they're new. They've been assigned this, these barracks, these rooms with like stacked with bunk beds, three or four high. And then not only are the bunk beds like three or four high, but there's like eight people to a bunk. Like they are sardined in there and there's even some people laying on top of other people just so that they have a place to sleep. And so Corey and Betsy walk in and they try to find a place to sleep and they crawl over people to get to a spot in the middle that just so happened to have enough room for the both of them. And they're laying there for a few minutes until they start to feel bites. So they scramble out of bed. They go try to find like a sliver of light in the room. And sure enough, as they look at their legs and see the sliver of light, or by, by looking through at the light, they discover that there's fleas all over them. Fleas just covering their legs. And Corey freaks out. She's like, how on earth are we going to live like this? This is disgusting. And Betsy says to her, I know how we're going to get through this. We're going to do exactly what we read in our Bible reading this morning. Pull it out, Corey. And so they're huddled in the corner of a sleeping quarters in a concentration death camp. There they are pulling out the word of God and reading from 1 Thessalonians, which they had read earlier that day. And wouldn't you know it? The passage that they had read that day was 1 Thessalonians 5. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, it says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So Betsy turns to Corey and she says, that's how we're going to get through this. We are going to give thanks in all circumstances. So she challenges Corey, what can we give thanks to God for right now? And Corey's like, well... We can give thanks that we're together 
And Betsy's like, yes, thank you, God, that we're not having to do this alone, that you've given us each other. And then they start listing all these things. And thank you that when we came in here, they actually really didn't do a very thorough search of our body. And so the Bible that was hanging from a string around Corey's neck, they were still able to sneak into Ravensbrook. Thank you, God, that we still have your word. And then they looked around and they saw these hundreds of bodies, hundreds of souls that needed to hear about the hope of a savior, that needed to know that they were not forgotten, that needed to know that sin is sin and to have the hope of heaven. And so they praised God that they were in a place with so many women that they could then have the opportunity to share with even more people about Christ. And as they were wrapping up this time of thanking God, Betsy said, and thank you, God, for the fleas. Corey just about lost it. She's like, are you insane? That, you have gone way too, you are some kind of radical. You have gone way too far. I am not thanking God for the fleas. And Betsy says to Corey, all means all. All circumstances give thanks. In the pleasant ones, and in the deplorable ones, we are asked to give thanks. So Corey very begrudgingly is like, and thank you God for the fleas. <laughs> and so they go to bed and they end their night. Well, several weeks, several weeks later, Betsy's health starts to decline and she's getting sicker and sicker. And so the prison, the, the guards there assign her um, a job being inside and she's basically knitting socks, knitting new socks, fixing old socks, whatever. She's sitting with other women that are too ill to work outside and she's knitting. And at one point, they have a question. So they call a prison guard inside to ask, like, what are we supposed to do? What, what, I, I forget what it is. Some, something. They needed help with something. But before that, Betsy had been sharing the gospel and sharing that hope with those women that she was sitting with. And every single night when Corey and Betsy pulled out the Bible and read from God's word and talked with women about Jesus and a Savior, and the love and the hope that he offers, more and more women were gathering around them to the point where it was like almost the entire sleeping quarters was there with them as they read the Bible. And women who spoke in two languages were like passing it down all the way down the room of what it was that was being said, what it was that the word of God said, what it was that Corey and Betsy were saying as they explained the gospel. And Corey and Betsy had been like flabbergasted for several months. How are we getting away with this? Every other prison, bre every, other, every other sleeping quarters is getting like routinely checked and they're coming in and yet they never seem to come in here. And so Corey and Betsy started increasing in their boldness of sharing the gospel. Whether it was Betsy sitting there knitting the socks or whether it was in their nighttime like assemblies that they were essentially having, like mini church services every single night. So fast forward, Betsy's sitting there, they're knitting the socks, they call a prison guard in and he refuses to come in. And they're like, no, we were like, what do, you, what do you want us to do here? And he's like, figure it out. None of us go in there because we know that place is swarming with fleas. So that day when Corey came home from her long day's work, not home, but to the sleeping quarters, Betsy's eyes were shining and were glowing. And she said, Corey, I found out why they won't come in here, why we're able to share the hope of heaven, why we're able to have so many gospel conversations, why we've seen conversions and women leaning on the hope of Jesus. They won't come in here because of the fleas. <laughs> And so Corey and Betsy were able to truly praise God for his good, sovereign plan in their lives. Sometimes praising God for his loving plan means praising God for really stinky things that are going on. And yet, he is weaving this beautiful tapestry. Sometimes we get the benefit of seeing it this side of heaven. Sometimes we get the benefit of stepping back and saying, wow, 
I see what you did there. We heard it in Jessica's testimony last night. We heard it in Monica's testimony last night of how they can point back and say, wow, I see your hand. I see that you stripped everything away from me to bring me to a place of repentance and faith. I see the way that you brought me through this really dark time so that I could be here with these women. Sometimes we get to see the benefit of that plan, this side of heaven. But even if we don't, may we be women who are committed to praising God for his loving plan, even if that means we won't see it or understand it until we're on eternity's shore. Our God is sovereign and loving and the same way that he was just as intimately and intricately involved in my life with my silly transcripts, in Ruth and Naomi's life, in the sequence of events that brought them to this place, and in Corey and Betsy's life with letting them share the gospel. May we praise him. May we be encouraged by looking at this testimony that we see here in the Bible, by looking at the lives of those around us, by recalling how he's done that in our own life in the past. May we gain courage in his loving plan. May we then go out and love extravagantly, and may we be women who are constantly praising him, our steadfast, hesed God. Dear Lord, we come before you right now, and Lord, I just thank you so much for this account in scripture. God, I thank you for the way that the author wrote it, that you wrote it, that the Holy Spirit wrote it, in a way that alerts us to saying, this can't all be by chance. This is only happening because there is a good, sovereign God at work here. Lord, I pray that we would be women who are quick to gain courage and have a steel-like hope and trust in your plan for our lives, whether we're on the mountaintops or whether we're on the valleys. God, may we be billboards in the lives of each other, to our husbands, to our children, and even to the world about the way that you are intricately and intimately involved in every single aspect of our life. Praise, we praise you that we are held in the everlasting arms and that nothing that happens in our lives is by chance. God, may this knowledge encourage us and give us courage for whatever it is that we're facing today and whatever it is that you will call us to face in the years to come. Thank you, God, for being a God of Hesed. We love you. And we look forward to all it is that you will teach us and show us. God, show us your glory, not only today, but in all the days of your life, all the days of our life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.